What's up, what's up, what's up, what's up, world? Good evening. Welcome to uh, the lockdown sessions. I can't believe it's show 14 already. Where has the time gone? Today is definitely a super action-packed show. Um, I've made some adaptations, considering that I've got probably the lowest bandwidth speed maybe in the UK, possibly in the world. Who knows? But I hope that you're blessed. I hope that you're not getting uh, lockdown fatigue. And if you are, well, we're all coming out of lockdown on Saturday. Um, yeah, what can I say? We'll start off with uh, what I think is becoming my little anthem of this lockdown. Let's do this. And I see your true Never seen a truer colour in the sewers gutters Who has cut us loose and who is losing trust? Just assume they want us to resume with Satan Throw us in the face of danger while remunerating Your stable genius is brains a penis Your deep thinker's a bleach drinker No way for serious Brexit flag and exit planning while we're still on stretchers hanging Ventilators dragging, valentine to dress to mammon Foreigner despising, pocket lining, profit hiking And lobotomizing anyone who prophesied it Heads in investments, credit bonds, better lives away, hegemon, bowed heads before the hegemon. Lives wasted, discarded for blind faith in the market, in a car wreckage looking for ways to restart it. Stigmatized, ill equipped, the sick and dying, death to the death, but herd immunizing. Sick of fancy, sick of answers, sick of deliver rule, living, sitting in taxis, plan to leave us sicker with the vaccine. Power praising, craving, cowards counter claiming, throwing us in the overcrowded house and leaves the sour tasting. Protecting sectors, never in protective vests and medics and just sent them in with empty gestures. Fake preaching, labour leaking, weaponising, secret hate speech and racist feeding. Ooh. Hoarding trinkets, gorging, misreporting, inconvenient stats ignoring, we can see it all recorded. Opportunists jacking prices, casualties ain't stacked up right, wait the true colours might be black and white. Messengers shooting, deflecting questions, wedded to weapons and fuel and considered a few deaths a solution. In digital form. I hope you're all blessed and as I said not allowing lockdown to get to you um, please keep your comments reactions buzzing right through in the feed in this Facebook group it's always useful and I can uh, check that the sound and so forth is coming through I'm seeing a nice small but uh, intrigued audience appearing on my ecam dial here so uh, let's interact there is so much that I wanted to say last week that I couldn't because my data just completely crashed and didn't work. So I've gone to the liberty of pre-recording it, um, which I'll get into a little in a little while. Also this week and in next week's show, I'm going to be interviewing somebody very, very special who's um, gone through a lot, let's say. We've shared a lot of our journey through the Labour Party as left-wingers, as black left-wingers within the Labour Party over the past five years. And I'm going to be interviewing Ava Vidal, the one and only twerking girl. That's what's going down. That's going to be broadcast next Monday. I'm really looking forward to that. I think it's going to be a cathartic and important conversation. Because where we are as socialists, as black people, is it's up for grabs. Everything is a little bit nebulous right now. We don't know if the revolution is inclining us towards more liberty or more slavery. But uh, before all of that, I'm going to play one song and kick things off that way. Or am I? <laughs> Check it out. Thank you. 
annexation of the West Bank and a lot of distractions I mean since last week even two weeks before that we've had rugby gate with the idea of swing low sweet chariot being super offensive basically I think there's a lot of distractions and if you're somebody who's fatigued by this distraction then uh, hopefully this next piece is right for you man this is, at the moment we try it. and please do keep your comments coming it's good to see some group faithful up in here Representing, you know what I mean? Let the people know. But let's do this. Tune in. As I've said, oh, you, can 
hear me now. As I said, if you're out there in internet land, please keep your comments coming. Um, we're going to get to some new content and so forth. And um, share some great news, hopefully. But before I do any of that, I'd like to try uh, and drop a poem in, which is going to basically form the foundation of today's show. Thank you for your comments. Keep on coming, people. It's much appreciated. My laptop is just doing its own thing right now, once again. But I'm not going to be outfoxed by technology this week, I guarantee you that. Uh, <laughs> famous last words. Here comes the poem, which, as I said, is the foundation of today's show. It's also featured on the Black Peril, uh, the album, The Black Peril, so you can check it out there too. But uh, I'd like you to watch it. It's quite short and really analyze it, ask any questions that you will in the comments. Bearing in mind there's a time delay um, of about two or three minutes. By the time some of those questions come through, I think we can get into the meaty substance of today's show. But this is Red Terror, Black Peril. Let's do this. It's Red Terror, Black Peril, fever time. The masses need dividing, race myths and reams of lies still sit beside the feet of a defeated Kaiser. So you must be the virus. Keep inside the screams and violence, hate adrenalized, keep them unequal, feed them misleading lies, feed them people to demonize. It's all a sequel, secret ties, they keep disguised so we can't see the sky. Street sirens never seem to see them silent, off the leash and leaderless, iron strings stealing wire. Look, see, they're stealing wide. As the seasons wind, keep them blinded, flightless, feet binded, all at sea, they don't deserve a seat. Keep them sleeping in styes. Keep them uniting, keep them striking, you don't meet the legal requirements. People penalized, never seem to see the prizes or read the signs. Heard in the news sheets and wireless. Chief advisors, elite assignments, never seen to creep and sneak behind them. Just dreaming of the beast, Poseidon, ports and crisis, sailors reside beside the sea, never seem to see the wider horizon and the sea beside them. So row, row, row your boat to sow the seeds of violence, heaving, climbing, black, lethal creatures, increasing crime. You people need to stick to cleaning, sweep the dying, repatriate, tell them leave, we need peace and quiet. Heathens, disease has seized their minds, so it's red terror, black peril, fever time. It's red terror, black peril, fever time. Yeah, people. The very basis of that poem, and I think a lot of our current political woes, is this nexus between socialist revolution, for want of a better term, socialism in uh, its forms as we know it today, and black emancipation. The elision, the dangerous combination of the two is something that's defined, I think, attitudes towards Haiti, Venezuela, um, Zimbabwe, even non-communist countries, Angola, Cuba, obviously. And so we're gonna get into that, some of that today. Um, if you've got any questions, any remarks, then you know what I mean? Please pop them in there. It's nice to see some more people added. I'm not even sure what that means, <laughs> but I feel you, whoever it was that commented that. And I've got a sort of Brazilian tudo bang comment right there. If you wanna please interact, I'm gonna be probably throughout this next video just pausing and remarking and stuff, but hopefully also integrating some of your comments into it. So uh, without any further ado, because I had such crazy technical difficulties, I couldn't talk about half the stuff that I wanted to last week. And in addition, crazy new stuff has happened. So uh, that forms the basis of this rant, for want of a better term. I hope you enjoy it. Well, I don't know about you, but I'm pretty mad as hell that every time I want to broadcast, I've got slow data speeds, slow connection speeds. Free broadband would have been a boon, would have been a godsend. And I in it though have free broadband still have to pay for it service is slow and patchy and why because at the last election some numpties decided that voting for something like that was unrealistic the manifesto was unrealistic but the numpties said what is realistic is a bunch of career elitists career billionaires presenting themselves as anti-elitists and you fell for it a bunch of people with private castles and residences and Eton and Harrow educations telling you that they're on the side of the ordinary man and that they're anti-elites. Yeah. All of the achievements, if you want to call the death of up to 60,000 people an achievement, have only been possible because of Britain's very special relationship, very, very special symbiotic relationship between racism, 
and capitalism, and that's what I want to talk about today. And that's specifically why a poem which is the spine to the Black Peril as an album begins its red terror, black peril, fever time. Because the twin threats of a red terror and a black terror are what keep this country locked in a sort of mental slavery that's persisted for many hundreds of years. We need to stop asking and start demanding structural change. So consumerism, now we're being told at the end of lockdown that it's high time we got back out to the high street and spent lots of money because consumerism is the patriotic thing to do. Enough to have secure jobs, to have an income, who haven't really been able to spend in recent weeks. Get out and spend again. We need your money in the economy. Exactly, and if you followed Twitter yesterday, you would have seen a number of Conservative MPs have clearly been told to tweet out pictures of them out and about, shopping, buying things, because whilst... Is anyone else just, just amazed that they can come out and say this stuff so brazenly, without any sense of shame? Just get back out there and shop. Huge numbers of people will have lost their jobs or been furloughed. There are a number of people that have saved a lot of money and the government needs those people to go out and spend. But of course, it's a, it's a confidence issue. There will be families that feel as though it's, it's, it's all just a bit uncertain and that they don't want to go and spend money and people are trying to save. And that's the opposite of what the government really needs the public to do. To Why does the government need us to not save and spend? Connecting those dots is quite fascinating. Try and get everything moving again, and it, it, it's it's going to be a test of time, really. And this two meter rule, as you were discussing, I think will play a big part in the psychology of people feeling confident enough to go out and shop and to spend their money. Why it's high time, confidence. That seems a crucial word that just almost slipped past the radar there. Confidence in an economy that's built on spending, on shopping on wasting money. To revive the fortunes of the high street and line the pockets of the most egregious, rapacious CEOs in modern history. We've got to stop a bunch of basically rich parasites from going out of business. <laughs> we need your money, goes one comment. And this very perceptive one from Marianne here. It's incredible that they just admitted brazenly that MPs are being instructed on what to tweet and how to appear. They're instructed to sort of tell us to get out there and spend. And why? because it's also connected to newspapers. The media's model of income generation is ad-based. If we're not out buying faff and tat, if we're not out there just buying nonsense and wasting our money every weekend, then who's gonna advertise in their broadsheets or in their tabloid newspapers? Even online, what's their revenue model based on if we're not out wasting money? Fascinating. I digress. One thing that really stands out as salient during this lockdown was the number of bonfires that I smelt in the first couple of weeks, right throughout the summer. So far, there have been just people burning stuff. The skip man, I had to call someone out to uh, take a bunch of stuff to the, to the dump from our house. And he took about two weeks to actually find a slot window because everywhere you look in Hansworth and Birmingham is booked up. People are just throwing stuff away. And it makes you think. We're all realising that we've just been surrounded by stuff, useless fraff that we, we buy every weekend and then look around at and think, gosh, I don't need these clothes. I don't need this plastic bric-a-brac. I'm going to burn it. I believe everyone at a visceral level during this lockdown has begun to appreciate the corruption entailed in just buying stuff and burning it in this never-ending continual cycle of consumption. And if you're looking for a connection between that, the Black Lives Matter protests and Edward Colston statue coming down, then look no further than consumerism. You realise the nihilism entailed in enslaving, murdering, just committing the most brutal genocides in human history for rum and tobacco and sugar, perishables which cause human beings to perish themselves at a faster rate. They clearly just want us to resume the old way of life before we can work out any alternative ways to live or actually see the nihilism that's driving everything. Get back to work before you wake up. And as I said, it ties into slavery in terms of the nihilism of founding an economic system which not only kills black people, brown people, but kills the very consumers who are the targets uh, of this process. Throughout the past few weeks, I've noticed we've often struggled to find What's the balance between intersectionality, discussing issues of LGBTQ rights, um, all sorts of misogyny, ecological disaster, and the struggle for black lives? Um, I think the issue here with capitalism and classism is crucial to understand. 
It doesn't just diminish the importance of liberation struggle for black people, but you can't have one without the other. There'll be no end of capitalism without the end of race-based capitalism. There'll be no end of racism until capitalism is ended. Yep, yeah, it's extreme as it sounds, but that's what I believe. So why are all these viable businesses on the brink of collapse? Call me naive, I'm not an economist, I'm not a business expert, but it seems to me that if a business on paper is solvent and there's a customer base and we've been hit by a three, four, five, six month hiatus, well, the only reason that those build buildings and those businesses should go out of business is because of rents, because the overheads are continuing, they're, they're having to spend and shell out every single month to keep their premises open. So this is this new sort of earthquake that's being predicted at the end of furlough when they can no longer keep people's wages, what's going to happen? And all these businesses are due to just completely collapse. I'm a little bit confused because if everyone couldn't make money for three or four months, then why is anybody paying exorbitant bills and going out of business? But again, please explain it to me in the comments or send me some links. Maybe I'm being stupid, but it seems to me that the problem is property. The lights on their premises open, even though they're not functioning. This seems to me a crazy system. And actually, it's rents. It's the system of property ownership and where the money flows in that system that underpins all of it. If that all just stopped, stopped for four, five, six, seven months, then we could just resume business as normal, surely. Please tell me if I'm wrong. Correct me if I really don't understand economics. But it seems to me that the poison in all of this is the renting system, the rates, the ways in which businesses have to play, pay for premises just to to stay solvent. I can't help returning to a really basic analogy in my mind, thinking that if this nation was like the average household, like you or me, and we discovered that our body politic or our domestic household, as an example, had an outbreak of coronavirus, how would an ordinary person handle it? If your grandparents, the weakest or most vulnerable person in your household was affected, you'd lock down everything. You'd make sure that there was no risks of further contamination. You'd stop what you were doing, if you like, repent from whatever course was causing the illness in the first place and make sure that if one person is sick, then nobody is really helped. Br brass tax here. How is your landlord able to earn money if you're not able to earn money? Why are the people who literally don't do any work but just collect money from you able to prosper whilst the weakest and most vulnerable people in society are being thrown out into the front line yet again? You'd make sure that everybody was covered, checked, before then reopening that household to normal activity. I think that's just a very common sense approach that, bereft of any right wing or left wing leaning, really has nothing to do with political spectrum and just common sense. What we're seeing and witnessing is that we have a government with no basic common sense that health ministers get the disease, that they give confusing mixed messages. And I think that the flouting of the rules by Dominic Cumming and the mixed messages is deliberate so that they can sort of absolve themselves of any responsibility and leave us in the morass of this confusing sort of lockdown, unlockdown situation. If you needed any clarification, any proof that it's really an issue that transcends left or right, then just look at comrade Piers Morgan's uh, lambasting of government over the past few months. Anyone with half an ounce, with, uh, with a brain, can see that the handling of this is counterintuitive. It's stupid. If their principles were to protect the economy, it's done the complete reverse, and we're going to suffer a much harder economic impact than other countries that took the disease seriously. So how does this all relate to Black Lives Matter, racist statues coming down, effectively the crumbling of, of white supremacy? Well, as I said, it all ties into this idea of a red terror and a black peril. The tremendous fear, the aversion they have to a socialist awakening and a black liberation awakening. Nowhere is this perhaps more evident than in the recent responses of the Bank of England and various institutions around uh, the country to the question of slavery, reparations and the value and sanctity of black life. I find it fascinating and very revealing that they're choosing to tinker with the superficial nature of uh, Bank of England culpability in slavery and not touch the very obvious deep connections that the state has had to the promulgation and continuance of slavery over hundreds of years. So rather than have a very serious and necessary conversation about, yep, reparations, the Bank of England decided instead to 
theatrically take down a number of portraits from their building, which are, are problematic because pictures of former governors which had links to the slave trade is really what black people are offended by. We're offended by statues and pictures now, not by the fact that our material conditions are worse just by virtue of being born black, or the fact that the economic system that we live under is predicated on inequality that, can, that persists. So they're scarpering away from the very serious question and implication of structural reform and instead trying to distract us with effectively a culture war or tinkering around cosmetically with the appearance that they're anti-racists when in fact they're just as racist as they ever were. Speaking of people who want to appear anti-racist, before going on to that, actually it's worth pointing out that... Yeah, whoa. <laughs> There's so much that I didn't even get to say last week about that very interesting moment with Angela Rayner and Keir Starmer. I like to call it performative allyship because it's for the benefit of the cameras, but as soon as those cameras are reverted, we get to see just how racist, how divisive those people are. And even Angela Rayner, especially Angela Rayner, actually, she's been somebody who's made capital of, out, out of her regional accent and the idea that maybe Corbyn and the lefties and the socialists attract the wrong sort of supporter. We've abandoned our white working class communities. I find it just so pernicious and offensive. It's something that we need to really move against. I wanted to quickly also throw in the distraction tactics of Trevor Phillips just going on about rugby union, the RFU, saying that we shouldn't sing swing low. I mean, we don't care. I can honestly vouch for every black person <laughs> suffering racism in the UK. There is no black person, even rugby players, that care about that. Stop faffing around and start paying reparations. That's where my head is at. I look evil when my face is frozen. What's that about? It's not great. Demonic Cummings. I have to give my mum credit for that. Demonic face. Punchline. If my mum was a battle MC, she'd have bars. But yeah, we're offended we by statues and pictures Come now, on, not by the fact that our material conditions are worse just by virtue of being born black, or the fact that the economic system that we live under is predicated on inequality that, can, that persists. So they're scarpering away from the very serious question and implication of structural reform and instead trying to distract us with effectively a culture war or tinkering around cosmetically with the appearance that they're anti-racists when in fact they're just as racist as they ever were. Speaking of people who want to appear anti-racist, before going on to that, actually it's worth pointing out that demonic Cummings I have to give my mum credit for that punchline. If my mum was a battle MC, she'd have bars. But yeah, Demonic Cummings is currently trying to fill the civil service with yes men. It's trying to supplant what was an independent system for a far more pliant, Brexiteer, favourable situation with the civil service. This is profoundly undemocratic, right? And for the past five years, you've had to endure, especially socialists in the Labour Party, the idea that anyone who wants democratization is a Stalinist. Whereas these right wingers are behaving literally like fascist dictators, closing down parliament, ignoring the queen, running roughshod over customs, practices that have stood in Britain for, for hundreds of years. And to cap it all, making sure that they have their own people in the engines of power, running things secretly behind the scenes. I haven't got time to go into the HGV, is that right, the high development vehicle that was an issue with Labour councils, but effectively regular residents started to turn up to meetings and say, why are you building luxury apartments with no affordable housing? Apartments that have to go to foreign investors and there's not one resident from the local area. And they got accused of being Bolsheviks, Stalinists. I don't know if you can remember those headlines, but they're out there. The minute you try and get involved and peer behind the democratic political processes, you effectively get called a whole bunch of smears. And I find the smears that they throw, trots, bolshies, Marxists, lots of uh, iconoclasts. I don't know what they got next, but it's essentially a bunch of lefty hippies. Um, they get thrown at you, all these abusive slurs. Without go. any accountability. So they're getting rid of Mark Sedgwell and um, putting in people like Frost. It's a dodgy situation in the brewing. So it's out with Sir Mark Sedgwell and in with whichever plight Brexiteer they want in his place. It's... Uh, in with nepotism, effectively. And the handling of this Robert Jenrick case should let us know very clearly what sort of crony capitalists we're dealing with, what sort of shabby, corrupt people we're dealing with. 
And interestingly here, it's important to tie it back to the theme, the scapegoat or the, the reason why these Tories don't want to fund schools and hospitals is because it would... Yeah, let's, let's just pause that there, shall we? Let's have a read of that. Good news. Finally, the inspector's reports have gone to you today. We appreciate the speed as we don't want to give Marxists loads of dough for nothing. By Marxist loads of dough for nothing, he means the £40 million tax that he's avoided that would have gone to schools, houses, the poorest and most vulnerable, and of course, just important ordinary people for ordinary services in Tower Hamlets in London. If you don't know about this story, do check out, do some more research. But um, it's very telling that this can happen right in the middle of a pandemic and can happen in this country. It's supposed to be democratic. Funding Marxists. Yep, Richard Desmond and others have brought your democracy. And rather than have any sort of democratic accountability that we hold and esteem quite highly in this country, they're going to deride not just the Tower Hamlets as a virus, they're not going to just deride Labour politicians, they're going to deride you as a Bolshevik, Marxist, terrorist sympathiser if what you want is a better society and one in which people pay their fair share of tax and which the weakest and most vulnerable people are kept from the predations of poverty. What's happened to Maxine Peak over the last week is flagrantly disgusting, is, is basically really exposing what this current Labour Party and this establishment, what their intentions are, what their versions of reality are. One in which somebody can tweet something or write something and retweet it and be accused of anti-Semitism, yet the most virulent, vile anti-Semitic ideas are celebrated by other politicians in the same cabinet. So let me be explicit. Rebecca Long Bailey not only retweets an article which states interpretations of fact, and then apologises for it, and that's considered anti-Semitic. But on the flip side... So yeah, let's just quickly go into that. When I say statement of fact, the fact that Israeli armed forces have trained US police it's something that was mocked by Sasha Baron Cohen in This Is America. That whole Mossad trainer guy that comes up and gets the guy to run around butt naked. Uh, it's, it's such a factor of the militarization of American police that it barely merits an argument. The fact that they're defending against this shows you how delicate they are and how keen they are to protect that fact. There is a nexus that connects all of these militarized police forces, capitalism and expansionism, be it in Israel, in other countries around the world and of course in, in Great Britain, in the United Kingdom and in the United States. Rachel Reeves, who more than one occasion has praised Nancy Astor, a quite vile, disgusting anti-Semite and Nazi sympathiser, certainly not an unproblematic figure. The fact that there's this huge and obvious double standard in the same shadow cabinet should let us know that they're not serious about tackling anti-Semitism. Their objectives were never to get serious and tough on anti-Semitism. It was to just shut down any criticisms of the most violent forms of Zionism and to shut down any socialist participation in the movement. This is something that's been clear to me for the best part of a couple of years, but should be to everybody, I hope. The target wasn't even Jackie Walker, Mark Wadsworth, Ken Livingston, Chris Williamson. The target's not even Jeremy Corbyn. The target is you. The target is the idea of a well-informed and engaged citizenry who know exactly what's happening in politics. It can... It's a great comment here from Audrey. Again, the thin mask of democracy. Let's have a read. Come on, the thin mask of democracy is still on the UK, still on UK's faces, slowly falling. Yet no, not enough people are paying attention or are too easily distracted. And there are so many distractions that we've not had for the past few months. I think that's another reason why they want us to get out there and shop and get drunk go to the pubs you know why are we opening the pubs so keenly so we stop thinking we stop analyzing and stop working out that democracy that we've been sold is a crock it's, it's a bag of lies keep an eye on where those donations and stuff are going keep an eye on how the revolving door is working they don't want that and they're prepared to use any subject yes even the most disgusting issue of anti-semitism and the holocaust they're prepared to weaponize those very serious issues just to stop you and I from having a voice in democratic parties. I'm sick of kowtowing to supposed anti-racist racists, people who are prepared. 
Yeah, I've been blocked by so many people now. And you read the list of people that have blocked me, it says its own story. Toby Young, Alison Pearson, Nick Cohen. People that really, you know, Melanie Phillips hasn't blocked me yet, but I guess I've never tweeted or remarked on anything she said. Um, it says how bad faith they are in terms of wanting to debate or teach people about these things. Every time I'm streaming, I'm trying to perhaps start a conversation or educate somebody who doesn't understand it about my perspectives. And that's what they are, my perspectives on structural racism. Uh, I don't just want to cancel people and silence them and kick them out of power. And this has just a lot more to do with the wielding of power than the understanding and unraveling of racism. They've exposed themselves. Symbolically take a knee in some supposed act of, of, of solidarity, but at the same time bully, cajole, force black people out of the very same Labour Party that they claim to defend. There's been a profound spate of anti-blackness at the core of the Labour Party, and yes, in the soft left, for the best part of two or three years. And Hashtag Labour leaks. When Arthur Vidal or someone like me points it out, you basically looked at as a lunatic or somebody who doesn't value party unity. Well, I hope we can now see that this ruse of party unity is, is nothing more than an attempt to make, return the party to its undemocratic, unaccountable bevy of donations. I think it's fascinating. I'll just quickly make an allusion to a reference to a conversation I was having with somebody who was working for another candidate in Birmingham. I won't actually expose him, but it's fine if I say who the candidate he's working for was. That's Salma Yacoub. And she's an incredibly energetic, dynamic, you know, the sort of politician that we need in Birmingham. However, she's been tarred by this anti-Semitism brush more than a few, more than a few occasions. And, you know, long before, just before the last general election, I remember saying to the people working in her camp, look, if they can do it to Chris Williamson, they can do it to you. If they can do it to Jackie Walker or Ken Livingston, whose track record in socialism definitely eats up any of ours in the modern Labour Party, um, then they can do it to you. So it was about actually defending a point of principle, not saying that everything that they said was unproblematic or conceding that anti-Semitism is all a hoax or witch hunt is all made up. That's certainly not what I'm saying. But if they can throw people out on spurious grounds and grounds which have never really been checked and grounds which pretend to be representative of the majority of Jewish opinion, which I don't know how they can be. A good Jewish friend in New York told me, two Jews, three opinions. So the idea that Emma Picken knows what's best for the Jewish community is laughable. I digress, let me let this video resume. It's all about the revolving door. It always has been about the revolving door. Read that book. It's so heavy. And again, pulling this back to the connection between slavery and capitalism, I believe that the revolving door first was flung open, if you like, in the rush to the Caribbean after the Act of Union in 1800. The idea that parliamentary position, that access to power could be predicated on having lots of money no matter how that money came about. That was something that really got its kickstart in the late 17th, early 18th century, in my opinion. Um, do check that out, but I think that then this culture that we've then taken for granted of wealthy, very intelligent and influential ministers and captains of industry was established then. And we learned to never ask questions as to where that money originated, how it was gotten, was there ill-gotten gains? Was it obtained through genocide, slavery, rape and torture? Black people know that Sir Francis Drake was most probably a pirate, right? But at school, at primary school, I was, certainly wasn't told anything like that at all. John Hawkins, all of these people are privateers who were then knighted after basically criminal activity on the high seas. We still live in a culture where people are just sort of lauded for being rich without us asking, what's the source of their wealth? What are their political allegiances? What have they bought? Who have they bought to be able to have that level of political influence? And it's high time we start drawing the strands, drawing the connecting dots between racism, slavery, and the capitalism or the cronyism which we endure today. I think it's high time that we called out this ridiculous hierarchy of racism that sees sharing a Zoom call with Jackie Walker as an expellable offence. Well, Jackie Walker, Mark Wadsworth, these are friends. These are, are conscious socialists. And if you want to get to know the reasons why they're expelled, then really just roll back the lens and ask yourself if it's about anti-Semitism or anti-democracy. I think it's probably time for anyone who's a bit confused by my perspective on 
Zionism and Palestine and uh even before we go there <laughs> look if you're one of my friends who's confused by my perspectives do leave your comments in on Facebook on the page even after this is broadcast I want to get into a conversation I'd created a post two three years ago and as a result of that post Jackie Walker hit me up directly I've had conversations with them directly and had a chance to evaluate for myself the merits of the claims that they are anti-Semites. I think you should all do the same because the one thing that this process has never had is the disinfectant of sunlight. Never had the opportunity to be assessed and appraised in a transparent, clear and impartial environment. Capitalism, to maybe declare how I arrived at these positions. I went to Ramallah in Palestine for the first time. Yes, the West Bank that part of Palestine that's now threatened to be annexed by an expansionist Israeli state. And what really struck me after a couple of days of being there was that this wasn't a war that had anything to do with religion, that had anything to do with the Torah, the Talmud, the Bible, the Quran. This was actually just about land, about displacement and about an excuse to build luxury apartments. I was in Ramallah in 2011 and if you can remember those long nine years ago, before Brexit, yes, those halcyon days. Um, there was a mania for luxury apartments everywhere. I went to Vancouver, South Africa, Paris, London, Birmingham, Manchester, you name it. Wherever you are in the world, you can remember this boom time of the building of luxury apartments. And I had this sinking feeling, and I'll tell you why. As we drove back from Ramallah to Jerusalem, the guy who was with me, it was a British Council show that I was doing with musicians. And he started to tell me about his own personal family history. He was Christian, which to me was already a shock. And telling me that Palestine was 35% Christian in 1948, that his grandparents remember having Christian, Muslim and Jewish neighbours and, and cohabiting. Um, it was clear to me when he said that now the, the current population of Christians within Israel is 3% that most of his family were forced to take exit visas where they wanted to get rid of them. The state of Israel had an intention to present this as Muslim versus Jew. They didn't want anybody crowding that picture out like Palestinian Christians or the fact that many uh, Arab Jews had lived in peace. In it's, it's so bizarre, isn't it? And there's almost a, a crazy analog with what happened with the Crusades, going there to conquer the Holy Land for the sake of the Pope and for Rome, ended up killing more Christians in Palestine than Muslims, than the Jews were killing. You know, the lens when you look at it accurately is really just one about power and conquest and using the name of God to do that. Palestine for, for many. Also, I don't want to not, not remember this, Theodore Herzl, one of the founding fathers of Zionism, was a very problematic figure. And I remember from Simon Sharma's own History of the Jewish People, BBC documentary series, him basically advocating for some form of tragedy, some form of catastrophe. He doesn't use the word Holocaust, but he's looking for a pretext to establish a 19th century nation state along the lines of all the other European powers in Palestine, way back in the 19th century. Well worth researching. Years. Now I'm not saying things were perfect, but what Israel did is effectively radicalize a community of Arab Jews all over the Middle East to encourage them through the use of mandatory military service to see the state of Israel as under siege. All I will ask my Jewish friends, brothers and sisters to do is to ask, after this period of occupation, does Israel feel any more safe to you? Is the threat of terrorism any smaller than it was when you were a child? Or is it basically exactly the same? Back to this theme of property development and luxury apartments. So we're driving around, I'm going to Ramallah, and at one point I got to hang out with some MCs and really chill with regular Palestinians, did a music project, and then we were freestyling and ciphering for about a couple of hours after that. Real talk, please keep your comments, questions, disagreements, all of that coming. I love it. Please, please, please. We're driving around and I saw a KFC behind this blue Perspex and a Pizza Hut that looked really shiny, but no customers, they weren't. That's exactly the shot. That's exactly what the restaurant looked like, except there was some blue plastic on where the glass is at the moment zero customers and from that photograph nothing's really changed open i said i still asked the guys in the car like what's what's going on here and they sort of chuckled and they said this is why we don't really care about two-state recognition all this is all tony blair's machinations have been about 
is to give a green light to Western corporations to come in and open a Pizza Hut or a KFC. Until there's state recognition, that couldn't happen, which is why these businesses were effectively boarded up. This is all about the rolling out of international capitalism. This is why Maxine Peake was absolutely right in terms of what she spoke about, not the factual details about teaching people kneeling techniques. If you notice, it's actually the thrust of that article in The Independent that is the problem for the establishment. It's that she's saying the same thing that I'm saying throughout this whole broadcast. You can't understand the nexus, of, you can't understand the nature of racism without understanding the nature of capitalism. And you can't remove pernicious racism unless we start to attack capitalism at its root, at its source, the profit motive. The fact that there is a nexus between expansionist techniques, big business, big property development, and the displacement of weak working class black or brown people all over the world. It's systemic and we need to start drawing those connections, drawing those strands. So I continue to drive around Palestine and then back to Jerusalem with a heavy heart. I've returned to Israel since I was just there at Christmas. Um, and the thing that strikes me is that of course, in the jazz community, amongst artists, amongst musicians and many other people, they recognize that the city Why do we never hear those stories of Jewish solidarity with Palestinian struggle? Because there's lots of it. But again, they want to present it as though every single Jew is, you know, not opposing what Netanyahu is up to, as though every single Jew is uh, behind the nation law. It's, it's terrible, and I think that is anti-Semitic in itself. The situation is untenable. The situation is not equitable, it's not fair, and it really has very little to do with religion and more to do with just displacing people so you can take their land, develop properties on it, and rent it out for profit. AKA the quicker and the sooner we see that, the better. There is so much bad faith anti-racism, and I myself have been the target of a lot of bullying from a cabal of British Zionists, people I don't know, people who hide behind profiles that aren't really them. So I'd be happy to be corrected or to have a debate with these people, but in fact, what they want to do is expel, smear, and leave you behind this wall or this this smear of anti-Semitism that you're unable to defend against. The accusation against me was repeated in The Guardian. So just when I was releasing my last album, The, the Black Peril, when I was going on Radio 4 to talk about it with Richard Coles and, and, and all that was great fun. Uh, I was just bombarded with a lot of hate mail telling them that I'm an anti semite and I shouldn't be supported or platformed in any way. Of course, thankfully, a lot of my Jewish friends and a lot of just friends around the world chimed in to say, shut up, you don't know what you're talking about. But the fact that they can sort of say stuff like this with impunity, I think is a problem. I think it's a problem and I think it's something that we should start attacking. I would like you, if you're still confused, to maybe just check the credentials of these supposedly anti-anti-Semitism crusaders. Many of whom... I'm just gonna shout out my homie Tanya there, who's Jewish, not my token Jewish friend. I've got quite a few of them, actually, um, but a lefty at that. And yes, the conflation of everyone must be unequivocally behind the actions of Israel with every Jew ignores the Bundists, ignores Orthodox Jews who definitely are not behind what Netanyahu's up to, left-wing Jews, people who really, and people within Israel, all the jazz musicians, a m number of them who I played gigs with and jammed with just before Christmas, do not agree with what Netanyahu's doing. Aren't Jewish, um, many of whom are really about anti-socialism or about anti-communists or about anti-blackness and if you need any more proof let's have a look at this nasha jew mishtal angry guy in chief sickening that anti-semitic anti-semitic extremists hijack an anti-racist cause to promote anti-jewish racism so black lives matter would put out a, a statement saying that in this difficult climate where you can get lambasted or thrown out for saying things about palestine we unequivocally throw our support behind the oppressed Palestinian people. Malcolm X did it. Angela Davis has done it. Mark Lamont Hill got lambasted, nearly completely discredited and called an anti-Semite for standing up for Palestine. In this country, it's no, you know, it's no accident that myself, people like Loki, Akala, express some solidarity with the struggle of Palestinian people. It's because we can see the connections. Not that everything oppressive that Jews are behind it, that is a ridiculous thing to think, but that money and capitalism and extreme militarism is behind it. Yeah. Well, I've recently been blocked by 
probably the fifth person from this cabal um, saying that Black Lives Matter need to be more humble. Yeah, I can't even put my reaction to that into words. I think I just quoted him back with a, a speechless emoji. But let's have a read of this. It's just actually amazing. BLM in the UK, I'm blocked here, I can't quite see it. Uh, BLM in the UK need to have a little more humility. Here's a pic, for example, of Angela Davis. Good Lord. Keep that woman's name out your mouth, man. Do you know who, and obviously, no idea who Angela Davis is in the context of fighting racism, of standing up for the Black Panthers, of standing up for black liberation for more decades than this idiot has been alive. But yet he feels completely entitled to sort of rant and say, let's cancel Angela Davis, cuddling up to Eric Honecker, this is terrible. Well, if every single problematic alliance, and there are many comments on this, on this tweet that you can check out, was, was, uh, was really interrogated. I don't think David Hirsch or many of his allies would have a leg to stand on. But it really isn't about intellectual honesty. It's about silencing very often black women. Hmm. That's your takeaway here in the spectre of violent expansionism from Israel, in the spectre of police brutality, that Black Lives Matter, a movement which is diverse and diffuse, needs to be humble. Be humble, sit under that knee and shut the F up. That's not the world that I'm prepared to, to live in or to sanction. I'm not prepared to tolerate nonsense like that. From people masquerading as anti-racist, when really what they are is bigots and racists. If you notice at the top, I didn't start off by saying what's happened to Rebecca Long Bailey is a terrible thing this week. It was terrible what happened to her, but I, I feel a little conflicted because I believe that in her distancing herself from Jeremy Corbyn quite deliberately and saying she'll do everything she needs, the board of deputies want, she's actually facilitated her own expulsion by not being stronger. And Jeremy Corbyn should have been stronger and all those around him, John McDonnell especially, uh, John Landsman should have been stronger in calling out the witch hunt for whatever reason they didn't themselves. I think another massive reason I've uh, arrived at the perspectives and opinions that I have, particularly over the past 15, 20 years, is since leaving university, I've been blessed and privileged enough to continue a career in the arts. That's meant that I'm certainly not rolling in dosh, but um, I'm not very embedded in the system. Not to put too fine a point on it, as I've spoken to other musicians, many black musicians about where we are, I'm prepared to see Babylon bond down. That was Patwa. I'm prepared Babylon Afi bond. And, you know, because I don't really see so much of my wealth being tied up in this current system, I'm prepared to see what happens with the birth of a new one. So yeah, I can basically afford to be a bit more cavalier because I'm not as invested in the outcome of Babylon's success or failure. But, I will say this, if you are somebody whose prosperity is implicated in the success of Boris or Tim Martin or any of these high street people, if the economy uh, more widely is something that really affects you, then I would ask you to extricate yourself from that system so that the things that you do, the life that you want to live, isn't contingent on an evil system prospering. If you can't see what's evil about this system or evil about the system of Brazil, and America in comparison to other countries that have dealt with. Quick aside, because somebody I spoke to today didn't know this, but Brazil was the last country on earth to abolish slavery. I don't think any of this was an accident, that Brazil, the United States and Britain are chief in terms of COVID fatalities. And Britain is worse than America and Brazil because per capita we have far more infections and far more deaths than anywhere else relative to our population size. The idea that you can whip, steal, kill, murder, rape, pillage a group of people just because they're indigenous, because they're black, they're three-fifths human, that sets a precedent. That allows um, people to believe that just extracting raw materials from the earth and making yourself rich off other people's misery is quite a natural thing. That these things are human nature, survival of the fittest. And we need to start seeing a correlation between what happened under slavery, rapacious extractivist capitalism, what then happened in the Holocaust, and asking the serious question of, are we doing anything different except hurtling down the same course to the same destination? 
just wearing different makeup, if you like, a different cosmetic appearance for the same nasty and ugly system. Coronavirus differently, then I ask you to look again because it has everything to do with the worship of the free market. That's our national religion. We're not secular, we're not humanist, we're not Anglican. We worship man and we worship the free market. They are said it. That's why so many of the parallels with 1919 and 2020 are staggering. We're at the verge of a large mass of people making the connections between the immiseration and the violence mated out to black bodies and black people, either in slavery, colonialism, sharecropping, racism today, and the economic prosperity of a tiny elite of people that tell us this is all natural, this is the way the world should be that where you are relative in that hierarchy is the product of natural forces and not some very heavy lifting, some serious engineering that was supposed to dehumanize people like me and elevate people like Dominic Cummings and Boris Johnson, Donald Trump, yet human detritus that they are. It's into this context that the danger of a general awakening between, if you want to call them that, the white working class, I'll just call them the working class, and the struggle for black emancipation that's been there for 300, 400 years. That is why Haiti, Venezuela, Zimbabwe, Gaddafi's Libya, all of these places are emblematic of a sort of terror at the core of Western democracies. I say Western because something even in that term needs to be found out. In the Leninist state for security Western. and starting with the security of the Communist Party itself. And it works down from there. So if you are identified as a child... Yeah, crazy, crazy cut right here. But that's Kevin Rudd, former Australian Prime Minister. And he's responding to the ideas, or basically the growth of China's power. But in it, it contains the usual sort of anti-communist tropes. I'm no fan of China, and I'm not even a communist, probably not even a Marxist. But I find the weaponization of anti-communism something that's a thread that runs through Western politics, Western. ...to domestic security then the explosion of the new technologies which provide locational devices, censorship devices, as well as um, other means of uh, coercing compliance with the state will be brought down upon you. What we don't know, however, uh, is whether ultimately this generates its own reaction in China itself as an increasingly wealthy citizenry ultimately buckle and say, uh, we're not prepared to put up with that. Open question to the future but it is simply not parallel to the debates we're having in the West. In the West, we can at least have these debates. The sheer In the West, we can at least have these debates. I don't think we can have these debates. In Australia, if Serena Williams points out a racist cartoonist, there's no debate to be had. It's just a bunch of privileged white people wetting the bed for months afterwards. Why? Um, how is it that Australia is a Western country? literally the opposite line. Yeah, just, just let that sink in. Australia and Britain, Western countries, even though they're on opposite sides of the globe. Longitude to the UK. What is the West begin and the East end? Well, the West means white people. And the sooner we start beating around the bush and start challenging the ideas of Western values predicated on theft and, and violence. And the thing that connects New Zealand, Australia, Canada, the West Indies, America, much of South America, um, is settler colonialism. That white people left Europe, went there and set up enclaves in Kenya, or Kenya, Karen, as it might be called in that particular part of, of Nairobi, in South Africa, little enclaves of comfort and privilege, and then whitewashed it with the idea that they are uh, emblems of Western values, of enlightenment, tolerance, and liberty and freedom. And it's, this hypocrisy has never really been unpicked until now. Asserting human values, I think we're going to be going round and round with this issue forever. I'm going to just rewind that last sentence because I like to interrupt myself. Then the explosion of the new tech... Boom. ...not parallel to the debates we're having in the West. In the West, we can at least have these debates. The sheer lie. Um, how is it that... Australia is a Western country. Yeah, wild one. Literally the opposite line of longitude to the UK. What is the West begin and the East end? Well, the West means white people. And the sooner we stop beating around the bush and start challenging the ideas of Western values predicated on theft and, and violence and start asserting human values, I think we're going to be going round and round with this issue 
forever. Word. Please do keep your questions, your comments on what you just heard or see coming, coming through. I know it's quite talky, but if you'd all have voted for Labour and we had free broadband, I wouldn't have to condense two weeks worth of talking into one week. We need to get these people out of here. And the circumstances that we've been forced into mean that we're not going to be able to do it through the channels of parliamentary democracy. We're going to have to bring the system to its knees. I know that sounds pretty extremist, but that's where I'm at. I think through our spending decisions, our cultural choices, our decisions to act uh, with our feet, to show our intention with our purchasing decisions and where we choose to live and how we choose to live, that's how we can bring about fundamental change. Just sort of pleading with people in power to do the right thing it's definitely not going to work it's not worked in the labor party it's definitely not going to work in the conservative party so uh, i'm going to quickly play this this spoken word piece one more time but please fire your questions up and uh i'm going to play a couple more numbers and hopefully remark on those comments in the closing part but tune in next monday because i'm going to be interviewing Ava, and it as i said feels like uh cathartic to speak to somebody who was at Labour Party conference with me in Brighton two years ago who herself has posted about the treatment of black women within leftist circles supposedly leftist circles I could tell you some pretty horrors horrific stories from my encounters with people from the soft left for people who consider themselves to be leftists um, and I find a lot of my bile and ire is reserved for them even more so than overt racists as Malcolm X described, we need to be careful of these foxes. We recognize a wolf, but the fox pretends to be something that is not. Word. What to play? Who knows? Okay, laptop. Let's see if this works. I don't know if it's going to. I'm going to get back to some music if my laptop wants me to. <laughs> All right, we're back. consistent continuity. keep your questions flying in there i'm gonna play for another two minutes or so but um keep your comments and questions flying in and um
make my special announcement now I think I think now is a good time there's been a lot of music and a lot of negativity but into the fray we have some very 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 exciting news I have some very very exciting news I want you to mark down 
the 14th to the 18th of September in your diaries because we're going to be screening a festival online. Black Peril 2020. It's going to be a festival that includes some of the best jazz musicians who are all part of the Black Peril Ensemble. That's musicians like Jay Phelps, Zosa Cole, myself, Yahail and Nono, an incredible ensemble of young musicians and uh, some less young musicians. And we're going to be going to historic sites around the UK where 100 years ago race riots took place. That's Salford, Hull, Liverpool, Cardiff, Stroke, Newport, London. Places where, yes, there were enough black people to even have race riots in the first place. But the level of racial animus was so intense that thousands of people attacked vulnerable and defenseless black and brown and yellow people up and down the country. So that's something that we're going to be commemorating. Make sure you mark down in your diary those four days because it's going to be only available as an online festival streamed directly to you. Um, I'm going to be saying a lot more about it, but this is my first formal announcement on the stream about the Black Peril 2020 festival. It's going to be dope. Um, I can't even make more, much more of an announcement about that, but you should know, I can tell you now, that Kahinde Andrews is going to be a part of it. Nicholas Payton, the one and only incredible BAM pioneer in New Orleans, is going to be part of it. Um, Jason Moran, incredible jazz pianist, uh, avant-garde musician and artist in every sense of the word, is going to be part of that project. Hopefully some other names that are uh, announced in weeks and to, to come, but make sure that you mark that off in your diary, 14th to 18th. If I've been a bit quiet and it returned your text this week, that's what I've been working on. Some big things I want. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Let's get back to some music. This will probably be the last song and then I'll close out with maybe a rap response to some of your comments. The comments have been brilliant. Thank you so much for your involvement. And um, yeah, I'm gonna end with this number, right? Her. <laughs>
make sure that you uh, stay tuned. Watch this space for more information. I'm going to be posting it up obviously on my YouTube and lots of different platforms. But yeah, this festival is coming 14th to the 18th of September. There's a lot more commentary like this. Hopefully a lot more artistic spectacle. There's a lot of things that you can get your, your teeth into. Thank you so much for your commentary. You know what? I'm not going to respond to all these comments because they're so good. Anyway, you can see them all in the group. But I'm going to close out with the same poem that I said begins the Black Pearl. It's uh, a summation of the madness that we've been living with for a hundred years. And there are a couple of specific allusions that I make. Racism and division still sit at the feet of a defeated Kaiser. Even though we won World War I, it was just the beginning, the commencement of sorts of racial strife and confusion, which was to end up in a Holocaust and to result in the recent murder of George Floyd. It's a psychosis that we've been living under for a hundred years. And the whole point, the whole point of those race riots, and I believe a lot of the things that are happening today, is to stop working class communities uniting. If you don't think of, your, of yourself as part of a working class community, then think about the material relationship between capital and labor. The percentage of people, both in the US and the UK, that can afford to not go out to work, they can just stay at home and allow their property portfolios to accumulate wealth for them, that only constitutes one to 2% of the population. So in a sense, the other 98% who need to go out to work to keep the lights on in their house or to even keep their kids' school fees paid or whatever lifestyle it is, they need to work for. That's 98% of the population that is some form of proletariat. So I think we need to get over this specter of anti-communism and start realizing the similarities that we, we've got definitely outweigh the differences. Um, that threat of unity is the thing that keeps the racists up at night. It's the thing that kept the racists up at night 100 years ago and will continue to do so in the future. The fact that Maxine Peake, who is clearly a hero of mine, could understand the connections between Peterloo, which interestingly was 1819, um, I'm sure she'd understand the connections between the race riots of 1919. It's almost though every hundred years some big seismic event shows us who the country really is, not just the rhetoric that they present. So yeah, man, I've talked way too much. <laughs> I'm going to drop in this poem that I uh, just created a video for and it's de definitely going to be adapted and edited even more. You're getting the raw cut. This is Red Terror, Black Peril. It's Red Terror, Black Peril, Fever Time. The masses need dividing, race myths and reams of lies still sit beside the feet of a defeated Kaiser. So you must be the virus. Keep inside the screams and violence, hate adrenalized, keep them unequal, feed them misleading lies, feed them people to demonize. It's all a sequel, secret ties, they keep disguised so we can't see the sky. Street sirens never seem to see them silent, off the leash and leaderless, iron strings stealing wire, look see, they're stealing wire. As the seasons wind, keep them blinded, flightless, feet binded, all at sea, they don't deserve a seat. Keep them sleeping in styes. Keep them uniting, keep them striking, you don't meet the legal requirements. People penalized, never seem to see the prizes or read the signs. Heard in the news sheets and wireless. Chief advisors, elite assignments, never seen to creep and sneak behind them. Just dreaming of the beast, Poseidon, ports and crisis, sailors reside beside the sea, never seem to see the wider horizon than the sea beside them. So row, row, row your boat to sow the seeds of violence Heaving, climbing, black, lethal creatures, increasing crime You people need to stick to cleaning, sweep the dying Repatriate, tell them leave, we need peace and quiet Heathens, disease has seized their minds So it's red terror, black peril, fever time It's red terror, black peril, fever time Thank you so much for your undivided attention, for your love. I feel your energy, even though you're a, a opposite, not, not anywhere in the room with me. Your energy made it through, even through the power of Facebook. I want to see you all back in this group next Monday. And do feel free to share this uh, and clip it. In fact, I should also mention, if you go to my Patreon page, I'm going to be starting to drop a lot of the raw content in there. If you feel like getting creative, editing, cutting bits of stuff that I'm working on, do feel free to grab whatever you can from the Patreon if you're obviously a member with those access privileges. I will see you again next Monday. God bless. Thanks for tuning in. And uh, stay sane. It's a, it's a jungle out there. God bless you.